Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's wonderful to see you here in the Lord's house this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And in fact, it's going to be easier than ever to do that because we have with us today the Rejoice Chorale from Welch College. All the way from Nashville to Locust Grove, Oklahoma. They came in yesterday and that's why you see all of the equipment up here. They're going to be leading us in a couple of worship songs here in just a few moments. And then they have a number of songs that they're going to be singing. Uh, so we're thankful, uh, first of all, for the school. And uh, so many of um, our young people and uh, even folks who are on staff now, Caleb and Callie, uh, have attended school at Welch. It is our uh, National Association uh, School in Nashville, Tennessee. And so they have come today uh, a great distance to lead us in worship, to lead us to the throne of God's grace, to lift up his name and to worship him, and also to encourage God's people. So I'm thankful for these young people who are being obedient to God, using their talents and their gifts, the gifts that the Spirit has given them to build up the body of Christ. Um, It's just an incredible encouragement to me. Uh, to see young people surrendering their lives, devoting their lives, consecrating their lives to the service of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to the kingdom of God. And so we're so thankful for them. Be praying for them. We have a number of uh, our own young ladies who are in Bulgaria and Mongolia. Uh, Pray for them as they're doing ministry all over the world. Uh, Remember them and then also remember the kids... Students are leaving to go to camp today. They're going to be leaving at 1.30. Caleb's going to have an announcement at the end of the service. But be praying for them. Probably some of you were saved at camp. Maybe some of you were called to preach, called to the mission field at camp. So pray that things will go well this week, that the Lord will protect them, and that the Lord, listen young people, that God would already begin to work in your hearts. Do you have a listening heart Are you listening for God's voice in your life? Listening for what God wants you to do. He has created you on purpose for a purpose. He has a calling upon your life. Are you listening for God's voice? Uh, We are praying that God will do something great in your lives at camp this week. Not only that you'll grow closer to the Lord, but closer to one another and learn to love uh, one another more as well. All right, would you take somebody's hand? We're going to begin the way we always do with the Lord's Prayer. We're thankful that the Lord gave us a great week of vacation Bible school this last week. And so many children heard the Word of God and were gathered in His house. We're thankful for that. And we're going to continue to worship as we've gathered here this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful to be in Your house. We, we are amazed that in our darkness and sin, You have reached out to us. And sent your son who is the light of the world into the world. And not only that, Father, your light has shined in our hearts. And we have been transferred from darkness into light. We're so thankful today that our sins are forgiven. That our home is in heaven. That every day we're one day closer. Father, we pray that you would be with us today. We pray that your spirit would move among us in in powerful ways, in mysterious ways that we can't explain, that are beyond us, that are beyond our ability, that are beyond our power. Pray that even now you would capture our attention, help us to listen, help us to sing, help us to pray, help us to preach. We pray that you would be with these young people who have answered your call and who have come a long way, Lord, to glorify your name and to build up your church, and I pray that you would bless them. That again, Father, even now, they would feel the power of your Spirit as they have stepped out in faith, and they're going to be up on the stage here in just a few minutes, that they would be filled with your Spirit to lead your people in worship. We pray that you would bless our young people who are on mission in Bulgaria and Mongolia, that you would protect them that you would fill them with the power of your spirit and use them to bring glory to you and to build your kingdom, that the people there would experience your love and your truth and your grace through their ministry that you've given them 
there. We pray that you would be with our students as they go to camp this week. We pray that you would do great and deep and beautiful and wonderful things in their lives. We know that you hear our prayers because you are our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to worship as Rejoice comes to lead us in a couple of songs.
your might, and your power, your glory, your holiness, your forgiveness, your love. And we, we just come before you today and bow and worship and and we just we, we praise your name today. We lift your name up and, and praise and worship you. I pray that you would be in this place with us. I pray that your spirit would fill this place and move in us and through us. I pray that as as we continue in our worship this morning, uh, or our singing to you uh, would, would glorify and honor you. Uh, and I pray that you would be lifted up in our worship this morning. I pray that as uh, Brother Jeff comes and, and brings your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us uh, to illuminate the word so that we can understand and discern what it is you would have for us today. I pray that as we continue to live our lives in, in, in efforts to become more like Christ, uh, I pray that we would walk daily in obedience, seeking to grow closer to you each and every moment. Um, and I pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing and acceptable to your sight. Once again, I just I worship you this morning. And I thank you for your goodness. You are so, so good to us. You always have been and you always will be. And for that, we thank you. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray this morning. Jesus, amen. 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 You all may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord already, hasn't it? <laughs> we are the Rejoice Ministry Team. Now, you might have wondered where I appeared from. <laughs> We do not have teleportation in Nashville. Uh, I'm the sound guy. My name is Riley Holland. I'm a business major and I'm a senior. And I have the honor and privilege of introducing Rejoice, but also introducing Welch College to perhaps some of you for the first time. Uh, we are a small pre-will Baptist college in Gallatin, Tennessee. The closest city that you might know is Nashville. And so we are privileged to be here this morning. Um, the drive was fantastic. And uh, a little long, but <laughs> I, I struggled to find out what I would talk about and how I would introduce Rejoice. But then uh, I realized that I didn't need to. We have the same values that this church does. And I can tell that from meeting the pastor briefly and just interacting with you guys this morning. It's been a blessing already to minister to your youth. As they're preparing to go to camp, we got to pray with them, we got to minister to them, we had to, a devotion with them. We already know that this church and Welch align. Also, it's just been such a great privilege to minister to you guys this morning. And that's the main reason we're here, is to reach those who have not been reached and to help worship those who worship the same God we do. And so I could not do justice what Rejoice is about to do in worshiping the Lord with you all this morning. I believe that through the song and through interacting with us after and before, I believe that our living testimony will be much more powerful than anything this old ginger could make up. <laughs> but I do have a challenge for you. In fact, I have three. If you don't mind, I would ask that you guys pray for us this morning and pray for each other. In fact, I would also ask you to pray for Welch. Be praying for the person beside of you and the people on this stage. That we minister to you, that we minister to ourselves, and then all that happens in this hour, that we worship the Lord. Secondly, we would ask that you, you think about and pray about sending your people. We are always wanting more young people to know the Lord better, to grow in a Christian education, and to be sent out into the world wherever the Lord wants them to go. And that's our mission, and I believe that's yours as well. And third, we would ask that you consider a financial gift. Now I know, you haven't heard us sing yet, and I'm already asking for it. <laughs> I can assure you, at the end, you will be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> In all seriousness, thank you guys so much for letting us be here this morning to minister to you and to worship with you. It is because of churches like yours that Welch exists, and it is because of us that we minister to you. In fact, because of churches like yours, nearly every student, including the people on the stage, get nearly $6,000 in financial aid. 
According to U.S. Weekly, we are rated top 20 in our region for colleges in that area. Specifically, top 10 across the board in our teacher education program, specifically with English as a second language as a, as a proficiency. But again, and I want to reiterate, and, and through the words that they'll be singing, it is only because of the power of God that it, through this to this college and through the prayer and support of people in churches like you. So we ask humbly that you'll pray and that you'll give. I'm going to give it to rejoice. Thank you for your time and thank you for being thank you for being what Christ commands us to be, a Bible church. Uh, like he said, we are the Rejoice Ministry Team uh, from Wells College. Uh, and before we get started with the service and continue on, uh, we just like to introduce ourselves to you so that we're not strangers up here, uh, so that you can learn a little bit more about us. Uh, so my name is Camden Lewis. I'm a junior uh, from Clarksville, Tennessee, and I'm studying biology with a minor in missions. Good morning, everyone. My name is Abigail McAfee. I am a sophomore from Gallatin, Tennessee, and I'm studying English education. Good morning. My name is Cheyenne Lewis. I'm a senior from Gastonia, North Carolina. I'm studying psychology with a minor in music. Hello, everyone. My name is Landon Wolf. I'm a senior from Circleville, Ohio, and I'm studying theological studies and I'm also the college's Master of Divinity program. Hello, my name is Brooke Proctor. I'm a junior from Pleasant View, Tennessee, and I am studying biology. Good morning, my name is Silas Hauser. I'm actually a recent graduate of Welch College from Chesterfield, Virginia. But I'm continuing my education to get my Master's of Divinity through Welch. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Wilkerson. I am a sophomore from Gallatin, Tennessee, and I'm studying music education. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Robertson. I am a junior from Amory, Mississippi, and I am studying music performance. Hello, everyone. My name is Melina Campus. I am a junior from Plant City, Florida, studying music education with a minor in missions. Good morning. My name is Mark Edgeman. I'm a junior from Montpellier, Spain, and I'm studying music education with a minor in missions. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellie Crabtree. I'm a senior from Edna, Ohio, and I'm studying English.
hearts to the great and living God. In Revelation 5, John says that he saw angels proclaiming around the throne, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. As we continue to worship, let us keep in mind that he is the God of our hearts. He is the great Father. He is the high King of heaven, but most importantly, he is the one who is worthy. Does the Father truly love us? Yeah. 
to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Rejoice. That was excellent. It's magnificent. Thank you. The title of the message is The Reason to Read. 
We'll see how it goes, but you may get the Cliff's Notes. <laughs> We're going to look at Genesis 2 and 3 and think about the story with Adam and Eve in the garden with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And I want us to think for just the next few moments about knowledge and learning and education from the biblical perspective. We have this group of college students that's come a long way to lead us in worship and also to promote Christian higher education. Last couple of weeks here in this same sanctuary, we have celebrated the graduation of our seniors and also the promotion of some of our children going on to their next stage and level in in education. We want them to grow in knowledge and learning. We give them books to read, to learn from. Most importantly, we give them the Word of God, which is the book of books. And we, we want them to learn. We want them to grow. We want them to grow in their knowledge. We want their, their intellectual life to blossom. The question is, how should a Christian think about knowledge? Think about knowledge and learning. The human capacity for learning is astounding. It is astounding that the ability of the human mind to grow in knowledge and to discover new information is, is literally mind-boggling. But is more knowledge always better? That's what I want us to think about for just the next few moments. Is more knowledge always better? The library where I went to seminary in Fort Worth, the library was bewildering. Floor after floor, Book after book, one on top of the other. In fact, it was both overwhelming and also exciting to see this magnificent accumulation of knowledge. Uh, Even in my own humble little study back there, when people come into my office, they look around at all the books on all the shelves, and the standard question is, have you read all of these books? And my standard answer is, I have read all of some of them and some of all of them. It's just a fancy way of saying, no, I have not not read all of these books. But pastors like to accumulate libraries. When I arrived in graduate school, however, on the campus of Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth in 1999, the first book I was given to read was not really a book, it was a pamphlet little bitty pamphlet given to every incoming graduate student in theological studies. And I still have it in my office. And it's called The Religious Life of Theological Students by B.B. Warfield, a great Princeton theologian in the early 19th century, early 20th century. And in this little pamphlet, the brilliant scholar says to graduate theological students, He says, ministers must be educated. The Bible says we must be apt to teach. And we cannot teach what we do not know. But learning is not the most important thing for a minister. A minister must be well educated or else he will be incompetent for his work. But before and above being well educated, a minister must be godly. The first book... We were given at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary was a warning about learning. Even learning about about God can be dangerous. We live in an age of information and we hear all the time, education is the answer. Education is the answer to everything. If we just had better education, better education. But is that true? Is the thing we need most today in our society more information, more knowledge? Is more knowledge always better? Let me give you three three things that education should do. First of all, it should 
make you humble. When you begin to get educated, you begin to understand all that you don't understand. You begin to know what you don't know. To become aware of all of the things. I walk into this library at Southwestern Seminary and I see floor after floor after floor of books that many of those books represent an individual's entire life's work. How could I ever master all of these things? You can't. So it should make you humble that I don't know everything and I'm never going to. I was never so certain as when I was a very young theological student. I knew that I had all of the answers. But when you really become educated, you realize I don't know much at all. Secondly, it makes you realize that knowledge is dangerous. Knowledge in the wrong hands is the worst of all things. Knowledge in the heart of a wicked person is a terrible thing. And third, it should cause you to be amazed in the God of all truth, the God from whom not only all blessings flow, but all truth and knowledge flows as well. So in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible lays out before us this first meditation upon knowledge. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Notice that, formed man out of the dirt and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put this man that he had formed out of the dirt. And then out of the ground also the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Notice this, the tree of life in the middle, right smack dab in the midst, in the middle of the garden, tree of life, and also the tree of life. Knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. This thing fading in and out. Okay, let's just use this here, Brad. This is not working either. Am I good to go? All right. So I want you to notice in this text, in Genesis chapter 2, then on into chapter 3, this is a warning about knowledge apart from knowing God. And that's the point. It is a warning about knowledge that is pursued apart from knowledge of God. It is a warning about knowledge that one might attain apart from the formation of the person's character. Knowledge at the wrong time in the wrong hands is deadly. This is what this passage is teaching us. There are two trees. I pointed out in the reading where these trees are. Did you notice? In Adam's world, where are these two trees? Right in the middle. Smack dab in the middle of the man's world. Here's the first point. Adam, you are not the center of your world. There is something else in the center. In the center of his world were two trees. First of all, a tree from which the life of God, which is a gift of God's grace, flows into humanity. You are dependent upon God for your very life. Life comes from God alone. And right beside the tree of life is the tree of knowledge, which is a word sign from God. Says, keep out. This is not for you to know. A prohibition at the center of the life of humanity with a flashing sign 
reminding humanity day after day of His limitation. God has placed limits upon your life and limits upon your knowledge. Bonhoeffer pointed out, in the middle of his existence, not on the edge, that man is limited. The constant reminder of man's limitation. There are things that are hidden. Things he should not know because he would not know what to do with them. Have you ever found yourself in that place? I have the power and the knowledge to do something. I'm not sure I am ready to know this and to have the power to do this. This is placed right in the center of man's world. Humans say, I want to know more. In fact, I want to explore places beyond the keep out signs. That's exactly where I want to go. When the serpent tempted them, they kicked in the door and they ate the fruit, the tree and the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened? You remember... Testing, one, two, three. Years ago, Jeff Manning was preaching at the leadership retreat in Nashville. And he had something like this happen. And he said, Mama said there'd be days like this. (laughs) So here's the point. Their eyes were opened. But what they saw was simply this, that they were naked. That they were exposed. They had gained knowledge, but it wasn't what they expected. And they said to themselves, what have we done? Have you been there before? I'm pursuing something that I know has been forbidden, and when I get a hold of it, I suddenly say, what have I done? That's it. That's all. Their eyes were opened to their own nakedness, and it scared them to death. Fear flooded in for the first time. Remember, they're reaching out for knowledge. They have knowledge. It's not what they thought it was going to be. And now fear characterizes their existence instead of faith. It wasn't a godly fear. If they would have had a godly fear, they wouldn't have reached out and taken the fruit. But it was fear that drove them away from God. And they ran and they hid. Their eyes were open. They had new knowledge and it drove them away from God. Is it always better to know more? Have you ever said to yourself, I wish I had never seen that. I wish I had never heard that. I wish I had never tasted this, never touched this. I wish I had never tried this. They told me I shouldn't, I did it anyway. Will I ever be able to rid myself of this nightmare? There are things that we should not know. Does the knowledge that humans have today scare anybody but me? Is more knowledge always a good thing? There is a danger in learning. There is a danger in filling our heads apart from the forming of our hearts. And this can happen to theological students as much as anybody else. What are you learning? Why are you learning it? What is it doing in your life? 
is nuclear power. We have plumbed the depths of the atom. Is nuclear power safe in the hands of humans? We've learned some things. Is it safe for us to have them? Is the ability to genetically engineer creatures to monkey with the genetic code, is that knowledge safe in the hands of humanity? Do we have the wisdom only to do good with the knowledge that we have? It is true, knowledge is power, and often that power is used to destroy instead of to do good. The Bible teaches us that there are three critical things about getting knowledge. The beginning, the end, and the center. And I'm going to go through these very quickly. And everybody said... You didn't mean that, did you? I know you didn't really mean that. The Bible's very clear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of knowledge. Proverbs says it in seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Repeats it at the end of the opening of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Bruce Waltke describes it like this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. He says what the alphabet is to reading. Notes to reading music. Numerals to mathematics. The fear of the Lord is to attaining knowledge. If you don't have the fear of the Lord, do you really know anything? From the biblical perspective, you don't really have any knowledge. Unless first of all you know God. What is the very first thing we are commanded to know? I was just reading this morning Psalm 100, and one of these students read Psalm 100 a moment ago, but Psalm 100 commands, Know that the Lord is God. That is the thing to know. This is the fear of the Lord. It is He that made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. If we don't begin our search for knowledge and truth there, knowing that the Lord is God, we will never get anywhere. If you don't begin with God, you don't really know anything. It tells us, first of all, the Lord only is God of all. Know that the Lord, He is God. Second, that He made us. That you don't even have existence at all apart from Him. We didn't create ourselves. That's one of the reasons in Genesis chapter 1, humanity is created last after everything else. Humanity cannot claim that he had anything to do with the creation of the universe. You didn't get here till everything else did. We didn't create ourselves. We owe our lives and our minds, our minds to God. God created your mind. And then third, he loves us. He doesn't withhold things from us because he's a mean God or father, but he loves us and he wants us to be a certain kind of people. Wisdom produces a certain kind of person. In James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, I don't have time to read it all, but the the thing to notice there is that James, the little brother of Jesus, when he talks about the wisdom that is from above, he doesn't say the person who is wise knows this, 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 and this. Instead, it says the wise person is a certain kind of person, that wisdom produces a certain kind of character. Being wise is is knowing what to do with what you know. Not just knowing stuff. Uli Chi, who wrote about the wise leader, says it is possible to know and to say the right things and still be the wrong kind of person. I can have all the right answers on the test, even a theology test and a Bible test, and still be the wrong kind of person. Degrees don't equal godliness. Education doesn't equal godliness. It is important, but it doesn't guarantee anything. We're not to despise learning. Learning is extremely important. I recommend to you education. I recommend to you information, but only if you're ready for it. Think about Moses and his education in Egypt. Think about Paul and his education at the feet of Gamaliel. The two most learned people in the Old and New Testaments, respectively, are also the ones who wrote the most scripture. So education is important. They wouldn't have been able to do what they did apart from their education. But they both cried out. This is too much for me, O Lord. I cannot do this apart from you. Apart from knowing you, I'm going to make a mess of everything. And so wisdom is not just about a formal education. 
Keith Anderson, I want to tell you about Chuck. Uh, Keith Anderson was a theology student a long time ago, and he wrote a book about spiritual formation. And he talks about Chuck. He said his name was Chuck, and we were as different in background as two men could be. I was a young man on my way through higher education. An inflated term if the goal is to develop persons. Keith, uh, he, Chuck was near to retirement, had an eighth grade education. I was of the privileged middle class. He was not. I am white. He was African American. I grew up in the northern city and suburbs of Chicago. He grew up in the rural south. He was a custodian whose job all day was to empty the baskets of important people and throw the trash out for these busy and influential people, decision makers whose choices would make or break the fortunes of the company. But Chuck was a man who had something that I came to cherish, common sense wisdom that grew out of his faith and his life experience. He was a sage, a seer, a wise man who could see more deeply into life than most that I had ever known since that time. In time, we opened to one another, and he taught me much as we were on the dock, the loading dock, the receiving dock, for my lessons in wisdom. He didn't set out to teach me, much less to mentor me, but he did both because in his soul, he was a teacher and a mentor whose wisdom was given voice in a southern accent spoken in a northern city. His words didn't add much information to my ongoing education in theology, not much information, but they continue to shape me as a person to this very day. Chuck knew who made him, and this made him wise and useful to God. Second, the glory of God is the end of wisdom and knowledge. Here's the question that we need to ask ourselves as our high school seniors go off to college, to trade school, to a job, as our children graduate into the first grade, into the seventh grade, as we continue to pursue information. Here's the question. Why am I seeking knowledge and what will I do with it once I have it? What do we do with all of this information? I've reached out. I've grasped knowledge. Now what am I going to do with it? T.S. Eliot said, Endless invention, endless experiment brings knowledge of motion but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech but not of silence. Knowledge of words but ignorance of the word. All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us closer to death. But nearness to death, no nearer to God. Where's the life we've lost in living? Where's the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where's the knowledge we've lost in information? The cycles of heaven in 20 centuries bring us farther from God and nearer to the dust. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden grasping for knowledge apart from trusting God. And this is where our culture is. More and more information, more and more knowledge, further and further from God. Where are we going to get? Death and destruction? There is a temptation to get knowledge for our own selfish ends instead of getting knowledge from God for God's good ends and for God's glory. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This can happen to the theology students, can't it? It can certainly happen to us, it happened to me, right? You go off to college, go off to school, learn a few things, read a few books. The next time you come home to your little home church, your head can't fit through the doors. Okay? There's nothing more dangerous. This is no offense to you all. This is a bi biographical statement, autobiographical statement. Nothing more dangerous than a first-year theology student who's read one book or read or taken one course and learned about textual criticism, something like that, come home to his little church in his hometown, and it's, it's, it's easy then to look down on all these ignoramuses who haven't been to, to seminary. Okay? And, and he can sit in the back and an old farmer shuffles up to the front of the church and reads scripture out of his old King James Bible and a little girl on stage squeaks through a rendition of Amazing Grace on her clarinet and he sits in the back and rolls his eyes. But the old man and the little girl are worshiping God better than he is. 
that there's, a, there's a warning about learning apart from the formation of our hearts. And especially as young men, we can get to the point where we say, I study my Bible to be able to win arguments and to destroy my opponents. And it's so fun. Isn't it so wonderful to win an argument and put those unbelievers in their place? But that reason, that, that is arrogance. That is vanity. I read my Bible so I can be successful in life. That is vanity. I want to read God's Word so I will know and grow closer to God, which fills me with love for God and others. So the third thing then is knowing God and loving God and neighbor is the center of knowledge and wisdom. Jaya Packer said a long time ago, a little knowledge of God is worth more than a whole lot of knowledge about God. I can know everything there is to know about God and not know God at all. Jesus said, this is eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Not about me. Not facts, not information, but that he knows me, that I am the Lord who practice steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, says the Lord, to know God and to love your neighbor. That is the the purpose of knowledge in education and information. Augustine said a long time ago, talking about reading the Bible, whoever thinks that he understands the Holy Scriptures, okay, take hermeneutics, Bible interpretation, all this stuff, we know all, and we learn all these principles and everything. Augustine said, whoever thinks that he understands the Holy Scriptures, but puts such an interpretation upon them, as does not tend to build up the twofold love of God and love of neighbor, does not yet understand the Bible as he ought. So if our reading of Scripture puffs us up, instead of makes us servants to love our neighbor and love God, we haven't understood the Bible at all. Micah 6, 8, He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to do what, church? To walk humbly with our God. Walk humbly with your God. Now go back to the garden with me as we end up, okay? Go back to the garden with me. To walk humbly with your God. Would they not have gained knowledge by walking with God? How long was it before God showed up in the garden when He walked with them in the cool of the evening? What would they talk about as they walked with the omniscient God who created them? What would they learn as they walked with God in the garden? They were, for, they were not forbidden from knowledge. They were forbidden from knowledge apart from from their walk with God. God's will is not to keep us ignorant. God's will is for us to grow in knowledge while we walk with Him. While we walk with Him. Not to grasp for things when He is away, when we have been tempted. God's will is for us to learn from Him while we grow in our knowledge of Him and to grow in our love for God and for our neighbor. Jesus did not suffer and die so we could... No more facts. But so that we would know the Father through the Son by the power of the Spirit. That's why he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Learn of me. Learn from me. And I will give you rest. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for our institutions. We're thankful for our Sunday school teachers. We're thankful for our teachers in our public schools and our Christian schools and all of the things we learn, the, the knowledge that you have placed at our fingertips. We're thankful for Welch College. We're thankful for how it has trained so many students from our own church and how they're teaching the Word of God and the, the, the truth of God from every subject as you've revealed it to us. I pray that you'd bless these students, continue to bless their ministry as they go from church to church and from state to state singing your praises. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would help all of us to walk humbly before you and to walk with you, to read your word, to get to know you so we might love you better and so that we might love our neighbors better. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Caleb has an announcement. Jason is gone today. Cal, do you have any announcements? Okay. This works good for him the whole time. I'm really going to be upset. Good morning. Good afternoon, I should say. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> it is time for church camp. We are <clears throat> taking about 60 students today to church camp. So pray for us. Pray for our leaders um, and our students, most importantly, that God just does an incredible work in their hearts and in their lives. We, we're just so excited. So um, just a couple of reminders, parents and students, uh, we are meeting at 1.30. Meeting, not leaving, okay? So um, we will uh, be loading up around that time just over there by the Family Life Center. Uh, also, if you have not already turned in the camper health form, you have to bring that with you. So I have some extra copies back there at the Welcome Center. Parents, you can grab one if you need it. Um, but uh, we're just so excited. One thing that I, we do want to do this year, this was Callie's idea, and I thought it was great. Um, we wrote down the names of every student uh, and what grade they're in on little note cards. And we're going to have some of our uh, camp leaders at the doors um, and we would just love for you to take one of these cards, and if you would just pray for that student by name all week, um, I, th I think that that would just be, be an incredible thing for our church family, praying for our young people by name this week that, that God works in their lives. So we have uh, 60 cards, and would love for, there's way more than 60 people here, so um, would love for you guys to, to take one and, and spend your week praying for them and, and for us. Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. Got to give a special shout out to uh, to Silas down here. I think Caleb has finally found a mustache to rival his. <laughs> Let's give it up one more time for the Welch team. That was amazing. I hope I, I genuinely hope y'all can come back as soon as possible. So thank you so much for for being here and making that long drive. Um, all right. Uh, Caleb talked about youth camp. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to my, uh, my emerging adults uh, group that is going with me to Kansas City. It's kind of our, it's becoming an annual uh, tradition for us to go on kind of a, a summer retreat. Uh, some of our college students and young adults. Uh, that's, a, that's a ministry that's near and dear to my heart, uh, to Cassie's heart, because after you know, we spent four years on a college campus doing ministry, so that has kind of carried over to our ministry here. Um, it's so important for those young adults to continue uh, to grow even after they transition out of the youth group. It can be very difficult, uh, but anyway, we've got an awesome group that's going to Kansas City with us. We're leaving Friday. If, if any of you would like to support us, uh, you know, we've, we've got to pay for meals and for registration for the training that we're going to on Saturday. If you'd like to support that in any way, just come find me after the service. Uh, we would be very grateful. So. Um, other than that, I've got a quick announcement uh, for the kiddos that Miss Amanda sent me. Um, it looks like they're going to have a summer party this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, popsicles, water activities, so kids wear swimsuits under your clothes or bring a swimsuit to change into, and don't forget your towel on Wednesday night. So that sounds like it's going to be fun. Um, other than that, I'm just going to let you read through your bulletin uh, considering the time. So thank you for being here. And God bless you all. Would you stand and receive the Lord's blessing? Silas down here. This is his second time to the Locust Grove Free Will Baptist Church. This is Aaron Pontius's little brother. Casey Gortney Pontius's husband's little brother. And he was here, I think he was about four years old. And I think he was in Casey and Aaron's wedding. So... Welcome back home, Silas. We're so glad you came back. <laughs> Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you 
and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.